you don't have a sermon outline this morning, you will definitely need one. We are going to be looking at Psalm 67. Take your Bible and turn with me to Psalm 67, if you would. And we're going to look at what we've just sung about, this picture of God's work in the world. There's a map in front of you on the screen, kind of shows a dimmed view of the nations of the world. When the Bible speaks of nations very often, it is not speaking about geopolitical nations, but it is talking about people groups. It's talking about the ethnos, the, the people that are made up from each tribe and tongue and language group that is there. And so we come to Psalm 67 to look at the beautiful picture of why all of these blessings. That is the title of our message this morning as we come to one of the greatest passages on missions in the Bible. We do take our break from Titus. Usually we're studying verse by verse through the books of the Bible. We love the book of Titus. It's written about mission work, in fact. Uh, one missionary commissioning another missionary to stay, the Apostle Paul telling Titus to stay in Crete and to help churches that are in trouble. And so this morning, this message actually goes right along with the rest of our messages from Titus. And it certainly goes along with our prayers this morning for our own family that are serving on the other side of the world and for our own kids, our young people that are going to be going overseas to join them and to work in the next few weeks. Not only do we think about this mission team, but we think about other mission teams that we'll be sending in the months to come. We think about other regions of the world, not only Southeast Asia, but I spent an hour and a half on the phone earlier this week with another couple that grew up here in this church, Mark and Kathy in the Middle East, and they are calling us to come and to assist them, calling us to come and help them. And so we are working on those plans as well. Um, so as we look at this, this message and this emphasis that really is woven throughout all of God's scripture and all of his redeeming plan applies very well to us this morning. I believe that when we come to talk about the nations, when we come to talk about God's work among the nations, this is actually the most exciting thing that Christians can preach about, that Christians can study, and listen to this, that Christians can participate in. I know that some of you grew up in contexts where the missionary comes in from Africa or he comes in from somewhere else, and they set up the slide projector, and everybody would go, oh no. How long is this going to be? What in the world is going to happen? Now, some of you, your hearts were thrilled when you saw that. Others, you weren't so sure. I have often thought that this is the most thrilling and the most exciting aspect of all the Christian life. I remember the first time I went overseas. I remember that I was with a group called Operation Mobilization, and um, our task was to load up these little camping vans in Western Europe, um, this was back when there was an iron curtain or a fence between Western Europe and Eastern Europe. Some of you lived behind that fence. Some of you who lived in the Baltic states, we have a few folks in our church from there. We have a few folks that are behind even over in Russia. And um, I, I remember this was before the iron curtain came down, and we were taking uh, Bibles and discipleship materials to university students behind the Iron Curtain. So we would load up in Vienna, Austria. Um, we had all of our camping gear on top, and we would drive through the borders um, into Czechoslovakia at the time and into Poland. And we would just make trip after trip going in, trying to find the, the least busy border possible, typically, um, so that we would be able to um, zip through quickly. And I just remember that uh, one is we went through one of the borders, and there was a uh, a lot of searching and a lot of talking and a lot of nervousness. Um, I just remember that we were all praying very quietly as we were making through, and I got back in that van as they gave us the all clear to leave, and I remember closing the door and driving away and said, who ever said the Christian life is boring? <laughs> I believe that missions are the most exciting thing that we can do, as we see not just the thrill of, of working and seeing God protect and, and provide for the opportunity of the gospel to go forward. But far more than that, when you see hearts that are, that are caught and steeped in darkness being set free 
by the light of Christ and the hope of the gospel and where there was no hope to where there becomes the hope of all mankind that we could ever hope and, and have thrill in, we find the light of Christ. And that is the most exciting thing that we can look to. And so this morning as we come to Psalm 67, I want you to notice, I, I have uh, structured this because um, there's, a, there's a structure in the way the Psalms are laid out, certain ones, and uh, you notice it's very different than normal. Usually we have a straight line down um, through this, but you're going to see um, the way this Psalm has been written that it makes great sense to show it in this manner. But notice with me Psalm 67, and I'll begin reading in verse 1. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us that your way may be known on earth. Your saving power, where? Among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you judge the peoples with equity, and you guide the nations upon the earth. Verse 5, let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. There's some themes here I want us to see. The first thing I want you to know is that in the context of this, this is part of a group of psalms. There are four psalms that are together, Psalm 65, 66, this one, Psalm 67, and the next one, Psalm 68, and they are all about God. You say, well, that's good. It's good that psalms are about God, but they're not only about God, they are also about the nations of the world. They are about God and his work in the nations. All four of these psalms deal with that. And the first three deal with the great hope like this. The, the fourth one, Psalm 68, is God's judgment upon the nations. But here we see a cluster of psalms focusing on God's glory and his work in all the earth. Number two, I want you to notice this. There's a strange word that is here. I want you to notice the chiastic structure. A, a, a chiastic structure is a structure that repeats in reverse. And so you, if you think about it with me, and just kind of think about this for a second, as, you, as we write in English, we, we have different punctuation that we use. We have punctuation marks like question marks, and we have exclamation points, and we have quotes, and we have colons, we have semicolons. We, we have a various amount of these things that can help bring about an emphasis. Well, in ancient Hebrew and much ancient literature of the world, those little punctuation marks don't work. They are not there. And so instead, the writers would, would structure their flow in such a way as to make a point or make an emphasis. And that's exactly what we see in this hymn, and I want you to see it in this song that is here. Um, notice with me that this brings about emphasis and it brings about meaning. Now, I've made a few screens. You want to look at the screen above. First of all, in verse 1 and 2, in verse 6 and 7, they are similar thoughts. They're not the exact same thought, but they are similar thoughts. In those verses, you see over and over again the word bless, you see earth, you see nations. Those are the same, not the same, but they are they're very similar in verses 1 and 2 and verse 6 and 7. And then look at verse 3 and 5. Can you read verse 3 out loud with me? Let's read it out loud. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Now would you read verse 5 with me? Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. What did you notice? It's the exact same thing. And so if these were lined up, you could say verse 1 and 2 was a verse, and then verse 3 is the chorus, and then verse 4 is another verse, verse 5 is the chorus. But here we see in a chiastic structure that the first two verses are similar to the last two verses, Verse 3 and verse 5 are identical, and they're all pointing to verse 4. Now look at verse 4. 
Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you judge the peoples with equity. You are a right and fair God. You, you, you are fair in your own righteousness. That, that's where his fairness comes from, is in his righteousness. Look at the last one there. And the guide, he guides the nations upon the earth. So he is the sovereign God that is in control. The great apex of this, or the great climax of this, is verse, verse 4, where the nations can be glad and shout for joy. Well, I want us to see how this works together. We see this in verse 3. Notice this, it is, or, or number 3 um, on your outline. It is often classified as a psalm of thanksgiving, but it also is a psalm of petition and request. You know, when we see the word bless show up a lot, we hear those psalms very often around Thanksgiving time, um, and not just talking about the American uh, uh, holiday of Thanksgiving, but we also think about just the idea of Thanksgiving in our lives. So every time we use the word Thanksgiving, it doesn't mean the American holiday. It means when we give thanks. You can give thanks throughout the year. I hope you give thanks every day. Um, That's part of the picture of of being God's children, is to see his goodness and his greatness and, and all of his care and generosity to us that we would express to him gratitude. And so as part of this, many would say, well, this is a psalm about giving thanks to God. But no, it's, it's also a request. And I want us to see that. Notice number four that is here. It is a call for God's blessing with a very important motive. Fill that in, a very important motive. So it is a call for his blessing, and it's, and it's for a particular purpose that we're calling for the blessing. And I want you to see it in verse 1 and 2. Lotus verse 1 and 2. It says, May God be gracious to us and bless us, and make his face to shine upon us. See, that's the call for the blessing. And then look at verse 2 circle the first word of verse 2. What is the first word of verse 2? That, or it's like, so that. So here's the reason that the petition is being made. So that your way may be known on earth. Your saving power among the nations. You see, the the request for God's blessing is so that people can see who God is and what he does, the way he works, and the fact that he can save us out of this fallen world that we are in. So there's a request, and the reason for the request is seen right there in verse 2. Now, this is a very high reason to ask for blessings. This is a very, a very noble reason to ask for blessings. When we ask for blessings that people may see God, then we're, we're thinking along the lines of why God gives blessings, ultimately. Notice number five in our context and structure. I want you to see this. It applies to us now, and you can write above now, you, you can write above that uh, 2018. It applies to us today, but it foreshadows the not yet. This psalm foreshadows what is to come that has not yet been accomplished that God has promised to his people that all of the nations of the world are going to know him and see him and they are going to submit to him. They will fear him. Notice here what it says. Um, as it says, not yet when all peoples will eventually bow down and worship him. They will acknowledge that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. Now, when we talk about the present day but the not yet, it reminds us of something that we studied for several months last year. You remember our study of biblical worldviews. When we studied biblical worldviews, we looked at creation, fall, Redemption and glory. Do you remember these? Biblical worldviews. Let's read these at four words out, toge- out loud together. We did this several times when we were studying this. Let's read it. Creation, fall, redemption, glory. You want to know what the Bible is about? Right there. Genesis 1 and 2, creation. Genesis 3, the fall. The rest of the Bible is God's redeeming plan 
his redemption of a fallen world, his keeping his promises as we're about to see, and then eventually glory. Some call that restoration. When God is going to come and rescue this fallen world once and for all, finally, sin and death and sorrow and sickness and sadness will all be put away and the new, the new things will have come. And so this is what the Christian hope is all about. This is what the hope of the Bible is all about, that his glory is going to be known and his glory is going to be perfectly experienced just as he has promised. So this picture is, this psalm is dealing with both of these. We are in this time of redemption. We are in this time of showing the nations God's goodness. We're in this time of telling the nations who God is and what he does and what he has said and what he has promised and how he works. It says there in verse 2 that your way would be made known among the world on, on the earth. This is the picture of his covenant, his covenant way, the fact that he comes and brings his people into covenant with him. Now, I want us to see that, and it's right here in Genesis chapter 12. So we're going to look at the bases of this psalm. The bases of this psalm, and not only the bases of this psalm, but listen to this, the bases of any hope that you have in your life is found right here in the beautiful covenant that God made with Abraham. Fill that in. He made a covenant with Abraham. He didn't make a contract with Abraham. You remember in our, in our church um, uh, starting point classes, we talk about the difference between a contract which brings two people together and protects them from one another in order to accomplish a certain task. That's a contract. But God is not a God who makes contracts. God is a God who makes covenant with his people. And God's covenant holds on. God's covenant holds on even when we seek to let go. And this is the picture of the life of the church. When you, when you look at the covenant relationship, not only that we have with God, but also the covenant relationship that we are to have with brothers and sisters who know God, we, we aren't in a contract where, hey, you post something bad about me on Facebook, I'm, I'm, I'm going to defriend you. I'm no longer your friend. You know, this is, this is, this is broken. Now, that, that is not at all the picture that we see. We, we see a relationship that is very, very deep, that's very, very committed, and it's, and it's based upon God's promise that he makes to Abraham. And I want us to see this in Genesis chapter 12, very early on in all of the, the scriptures that we see, that this is after the flood and after the Tower of Babel, and God separates the world. And now we come to God coming and dealing with a choice servant. And we see why Abraham would go and why he would do what God had called him to do. Look at Genesis chapter 12 and verse 1 through 3. Very, th this text is one of the most important texts in the Bible. You need to understand that this is where our hope comes from, right here. So notice here with me, Genesis chapter 12 and verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, so his name hadn't been changed yet, he hadn't been called Abraham, but the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. It doesn't say to the land that I have shown you. He's saying you're going to go in faith trusting in me. You're going to leave your father's house. You're going to leave your country. You're going to leave your homeland. And I have a new homeland for you, and it's going to be with me. Look what he says in verse 2. And I will make of you a great what? A great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. Can you underline that? So that you will be a blessing. Look at number three. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you, there's another thing to underline, and in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. The word families is very interesting there. Um, it's talking about a small unit. It's not necessarily a biological family, but it is talking about the, 
the, the fine nations, down to the tribes, down to the, the smaller groups, not talking about a geopolitical nation as, as one could, could, could think of initially here the first part of you see, what you see in verse 2, but now it's talking about down into the fabric of all of humanity, all of the different types of human beings that are out there with their different languages and their different customs and their different places in which they live. All of that, God's truth and this promise is going to bless all of the different peoples of the earth. So I want you to see here that this is the key to understanding Psalm 67, but it's not only the key to understanding Psalm 67, it's also the key to understanding your own salvation. I want you to follow me here as a few statements. This is our Redeemer God beginning to reveal His redemptive plan of promise to the world. So here, God is beginning. He's beginning with Abraham in a new way. Sure, he worked through Noah. He worked through the ark. He worked through Noah's faithfulness. And he came, and he divides the nations so that they will go and do what he originally told them to do, which was to go spread out and multiply and subdue the earth. But as we see that God is dividing the nations, he is calling out one particular man and his particular tribe in which to bless all of the others through him. And so this is God's promise that he is going to bring salvation to the world. Notice the next to the last statement that is there. Our Redeemer God gives his word and keeps his word. Now this is a very big deal to God. God is a God of truth. The Bible says that Jesus declared, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so he is the truth. This is a, a God not only of truth, but he is truth. And so when he speaks and when he says something, when he makes a promise, he keeps it. Now we kind of, we live in a world where that's being lost increasingly. Truth does not hold on very long. Companies make promises and then they don't keep them. Um, people make promises to one another, and then they don't keep them. The expectation for truth is being lowered more and more and more as we ramble on toward the end of this age. Truth becomes a more nebulous concept. In fact, we often talk about relative truth. Truth is relative. That what, what's true for you is not necessarily true for me, and what's true for me is not necessarily true for you. We forget the absolutes. That's like saying gravity doesn't exist if you don't want it to. Well, you may not want it to, but the reality is if you jump off a building, you're going to hit the ground. You'll discover how real it is. And that is, very tr that is very similar to the issue of truth. You may think there is no truth, but one day you'll find out that there is. And so we, we come to see that this is a God who, who makes promises, and he keeps those promises. He keeps those promises very diligently. Even when his people don't keep their promises, this God does. And this is the nature of our salvation. This is the nature of why we can have hope that God is beyond the type of teller that we are. He is a truth teller. I want you to see this last line. It's very important. I want you to notice this. And there's two passages that we're going to be careful to look at on the screen before you, but look what it says. Our Redeemer God's word, this word, this promise, becomes flesh. You see, when this word becomes flesh, he is showing, he, don't, don't turn your sheet over, we're going to look at some things, you're going to want to take some notes here. He is showing that he keeps his promise. Now, we, we didn't know no, what to expect, the world didn't quite they weren't sure how he was going to keep this promise. But let me tell you that there were some shepherds outside of Bethlehem one night, and they started to have a clue. I mean, we just mentioned Isaac Watts, who wrote Joy to the World. We, we see that the, the first big picture of who this was that was born in Bethlehem is the one who brings joy to those with whom God is well pleased, those who are part of his called nation. This is the hope arrived. Look at John chapter 1. 
um, in verse 1 through 2, and this is on the screen in front of you. Look what it says. John's gospel begins with these words. So when John tells the story of Jesus, he begins talking about this word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. It goes on to say all things were created through him. So this is God of God. Look at verse 14. And the word, this is the second person of the Trinity, the Lord Jesus himself, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father. And look what it says, full of what? Grace, Grace and truth. You see, this is the hope of the nations. The hope of the nations is, is that the promise that was made to Abraham, that through his line, through his family, all of the families of the world would be blessed. And they would all be blessed by the one who would come that would be the God incarnate word made flesh. Look at Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. It seems like we hardly go a Sunday in the life of our church without looking at these glorious verses. Look at Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5. Paul is writing to the Philippians and he says to them, have this mind among yourselves which is yours in Christ Jesus. If you're in Christ, and now it's going to talk about what Jesus did. Look at verse 6 who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped or to held on to. Verse 7, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. You could write out there to the side, starting with a little baby. He became a baby. This God shows us his grace and his humility by becoming a baby comes in human form. Look what it says, being born in the likeness of men, verse 8. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. So not only a helpless babe, but then to the point of laying down his life, to the point of death, even, underline this, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed upon him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. You see, this is the still yet to come. This moment when everyone above, below, all around... Every human being that's ever lived is going to recognize that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. That is still the the yet to come. And he, being the King of kings, Lord of lords, that is the redeemer of the world, this is the beautiful grand promise that God made to Abraham. And this is the grand promise that our salvation rests upon this great truth. Now, I, I want you to see, and it's safe to flip your page over here. I want you to see this. This blessing, this blessing um, is so that the nations may know and praise and fear God. That is where this blessing goes. This blessing goes from Genesis all through the picture of God working in Abraham's life, God working in Israel's life, God working with his chosen people, the nation of God set aside for a particular purpose. Very interesting that God is dealing with one ethnic group at that point in the Old Testament. But then, when we come to the New Testament, we see that go into a totally different mode as God expands the way he is working in this for the nations as part of his preconceived plan. Notice this, so the nations may know and praise and fear God. I wanted to go back, and I've put the text on the sheet again on the back so you can see it very clearly. I want you to begin to get this again. So let's read in verse 1. He says, may God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us. Why? Verse 2, so that you may, so that your way may be known on the earth, your saving power among all nations. Look at verse 3. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples, circle the word all, all the peoples praise you. Verse 4, 
Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon the earth. Let all the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Verse 6, the earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. Let all the ends of the earth fear his name. So the, the whole picture is this, is that we see that God is going to make it so that his people, his people from every tribe and every tongue and every language, as Revelation 4 and 5 tells us, they are going to come to know God, to praise God, and to fear God. This does not mean that all will be saved. This does not mean that all people in all of those people groups will be saved. That is universalism, which is not biblical. Universalism does not recognize that the Scripture very, very clearly shows that there is a difference between the righteous and the wicked. And the only way to become the righteous is through God's covenant with Abraham, God's covenant with his people, that God would come and that he would provide a way. We cannot be righteous within ourselves. Our righteousness comes from God's covenant with us, God's provision for a sacrifice for our sins. And so the righteous, when you read about the righteous in Psalm 1, when you read about the righteous throughout the Scriptures, you begin to see that God is saying that the ones that are righteous are the ones that He makes righteous. We're not talking about self-righteousness. We're talking about the righteousness of Christ that is given to His people. And so this is a God who saves us in spite of who we are. And this is the picture that we come to see is that all of those who come and cast their hope and cast their care upon what Christ has called us to, which is life in him, that we cast our faith upon him, he comes and redeems us by his own blood. Notice here with me that verses 1 and 2, the nations may see his covenant, this is his way, it says his way, and his saving power. That's what you see in verse 2, that your way may be known on the earth. What is his way? His way is through sacrifice. It's not through our sacrifice. It's through Christ's sacrifice. So the, the way that this is all pointing to is Messiah, the one who would come and do what we could not do. And then look what that does. It is his saving power among the nations. Verses 6 and 7 shows us that the nations may see him clearly, look at this, clearly in fear and in reverence. Look at verse 7. God shall bless us. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. Now, the idea of fearing him, here in American context, we, that's a negative connotation. But let me tell you, it's not a negative thing to fear God. It is a very positive thing to fear God. Um, my ninth grade year at South Broward High School, right over here across town, I remember going to my English class, first day of class, and uh, Mrs. Herzog was my English teacher, and Mrs. Herzog was getting to know everybody in the class, and she started postulating some very provocative questions concerning faith and reason in my English class, and she was a real intellectual, And she was asking us, what are the most important things in life? And I remember she was just going down the road. So what is the most important thing to you? What is your name? And what is your name? Okay, what what is the most important thing to you? What is the most important, what is the most important thing that you can know? And I remember I was sitting three quarters of the way back, second row over, remember it like it was yesterday. And she comes to me and she goes, Coleman, I know your brother Mark and I know your sister Kelly. And I said, yes. And she said, because she had already taught them. And she said, what is the most important thing in life, Coleman? And I said, well, to fear God. And she loved that. She had this little ninth grader for lunch um, right there in front of everyone. She said, to fear God? God being so good that he wants us to fear him? What kind of a father is that? I was on the hot seat that day. I remember it well. But what I, what I have learned to respond is that the fear of God is the safest place for any human being to ever find themselves. To know who God is and to know what he wants, to know who you are not and to know what you need, 
That is the safest place a person can be. It's to come and to look and see that this awesome God is also a God of grace and of love. And that he says, all who come to me, I will in no wise cast out. The difference is, do we know the way to him? You see, that's what Psalm 67 verse 2 says, is that it is his glory that shows his way to the earth. And so this picture of coming to fear him is a good thing. There's two bullet points here that I really want you to see. Sheridan Hills, I want you to get this and to understand this. This will help you not only as you read the Old Testament, but as you look at the New Testament and as you look at your own obedience in your own life. The first bullet point says this. God's witness to the nations in the Old Testament was come and see. Come and see his people. God was saying to the world, Come and see, my people. Come and see the nation that I have, the nation of Israel. Come and see their laws. Come and see their worship. Come and see their ways. Come and see what I am doing with them. Come and see my faithfulness to them. So the Babylonians and the Assyrians and the Phoenicians and the Egyptians and all that are there in the Old Testament, they're all invited to look and to see this people with their God so that they may come to see who he is and who they are not. And there's beautiful, dramatic story after story after story, not only of God's power on behalf of Israel, but also God's power of discipline and correction and chastisement of his people, that this God not only is a God who will defend, but he also is a God who will correct. And so there is great difficulty upon the nation of Israel, but what they see over and over again, any outside nation looking in and understanding the history would begin to see that this is a forgiving God. That even when his people leave him, even when his people reject him, this is a God who comes and he, he has a new mercy that is upon them from time to time to time as they learn to walk in his ways. And this same mercy is for us. But notice here with me, we are called to come and see his blessings upon them. We are called, to, or the nations are called to come and see the worship of God, his holiness, his justice, and his mercy. Now, the New Testament still saved through the exact same way, all dependent upon the sacrifice and provision of God, but here we see a different approach when it comes to offering to the nations the salvation of God. We don't see it that it is a come and see, but we see in the New Testament that it is his people that are told to go and tell. No longer is it an invitation for the nations to come and see, but to go and to tell. Now, there's some churches that here 2,000 years later haven't figured that out. They're still telling the world to come and see. They're still just simply inviting people to church. They're still simply saying, just come and see. Come and see God's people. But what the picture is that we see throughout the New Testament is over and over and over again, God's people are told to go and tell. Go and tell who this God is to obey in this great picture. And I want you to see, and on on your outline here, circle Matthew 28, 19 through 20 on the left, and circle Acts 1, 8. Those two we are very used to seeing um, as great commission statements. We almost always quote Matthew 28, 19 through 20, where we're told to go and tell, or we go to Acts chapter 1, 8, and you'll see that in just a second. But I want you to notice that in every gospel, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, all four of those have great commission statements in them, and I want you to see them very quickly. Look at the screen where it says, Matthew 28, 19 through 20, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching to them to observe all that I command you. Look at Mark 16. Here is another one that we don't often look at. It's very short. Look what it says. Jesus said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to what? All creation, go and tell every nation. Look at Luke chapter 24, and this is on the road to Emmaus. 
Jesus is walking with them. And it says there, and Jesus says that it is written, the Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. Verse 47. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name where? To all the nations. And then we see over in John, another very short one. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. He shows up after the resurrection. And he says, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Jesus very clearly. And then Acts 1.8, one that we also recognize very often is, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Over and over and over again, we see the Lord Jesus himself, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the book of Acts, giving the Great Commission. You are not to simply say, hey, come and see. You're to go and to tell. Go and to tell these nations that a Savior has died. Go and tell these nations that God has delivered on his word, to his promise to Abraham, that he will provide a way for a fallen world to come and find salvation and forgiveness in him. So the question is this. This, this psalm deals all kinds with, with the blessings. So here's the question. So why all our blessings? Just kind of think about that for just a moment. I want to think about a lot of different blessings for a second. Some of you have lived outside the borders of this country. And you have lived in other countries, you have lived in places of the world that are difficult, either because that's where you're from or because um, you've worked in other places of the world. We happen to have some great blessings in the country that we live in. We don't often realize that, the depth of that. Um, here in South Florida, we have the blessings of living in a place that is beautiful. We live in a place where it's not very harsh. Uh, when the wind's blowing and a hurricane is here, it seems pretty harsh, that's true. But by and large, many months out of the year, you live in an environment that is, that is quite uh, hospitable to, to us. Um, we have a lot of different blessings just in a physical way. You look around this room. We have a beautiful church. We have beautiful buildings. We have beautiful... Um, facilities that we can enjoy our children in safety. We can come and enjoy fellowship with one another. We have all kinds of technology that helps facilitate our worship. We have many things, that crudiments of life that are all around us, that there's many blessings. You, you go to your home, not all of you are running the air conditioner right now. I know some of you don't have an air conditioner, so I'm not saying that everybody has all of these blessings among us are those who struggle every day financially. But for the most part, we live very comfortable lives compared to most of the world. But you know, all of those blessings are not really the blessings that this is talking about. There are blessings that go far beyond these physical blessings that we often run to on Thanksgiving, thinking about our country and thinking about our personal lives and the level of wealth. Friends, there is no other nation on the, on the earth that has the aggregate wealth that America has. There's no other place. There's no other place that has the stability that this country has. There's no other place that has the kind of health care that you say, well, there's other places with great health care. Let me tell you, I've been to a few of them, and I, we, we came medevac home when Marcy had her heart attack from one of the places that's heralded as having some of the greatest medical care in the world. Friends, we have many blessings around us. But none of that compares to the blessings that this psalm is really talking about. This psalm is talking about the spiritual truth of knowing God and knowing God with peace and with proper fear instead of his judgment and his wrath. And so when we come and we look at this and we ask for more blessings without recognizing what God has given to us, we run the risk of living our lives in great, great selfishness. And I want you to see this. The first bullet point that is here is that 
when we have, when it is possible that our blessings, that we can have wrong motives concerning our blessings, and that is all bound up in selfishness. Bound up in selfishness. James chapter 4 says, you don't have because you don't ask, and when you do ask, you ask for the wrong reasons that you may spend it on yourselves. You remember when we studied the book of James, there was, there was great correction upon the early church from James, the brother of the Lord, who said there are so many things where your faith does not line up with the truth that you proclaim. God has called us to not live in selfishness of our blessings, but he's called us to live in the right motives of the gospel with righteousness. And this is a passage that I want you to see. I've printed it on here, and I'll close with this. Please, please, let God's word pour over you and show you the great passion behind the nations coming to the world. This is God's call. This is God's plan for us to go and tell. And I want you to see this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11. 2 Corinthians, this is Paul's passionate, clear perspective on why we proclaim Christ. Look at verse 11. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we just talked about that. You see it in verse 7. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we do what? Are you all there? Look what it says in verse 11. We persuade others. But what we are, to, but what we are is known to God, and I hope it is known also to your conscience. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us. You see, there were false teachers around them. They were saying, Paul's a bad guy. He's in it for himself. And he's saying, no, you know that's not true. And I want you to see that you can say, no, Paul is holding on to the truth of God. Look what it says in verse 13. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. And if we are in our right mind, it is for you. Verse 14. For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, here it is, that one has died for all, therefore all died. Verse 15, and he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died, for, for him who for their sake died and was raised. Here is the picture that God has called us to live for the beauty of Christ in all that Christ has done to save us. We no longer live for ourselves. We're no longer proclaiming ourselves. Now that we come to see that the creator God of the universe has offered his promise of salvation, we come to him on his terms and we rejoice in the fact that he has given us a reason to live and a reason to die. Look at verse 16. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. We don't look at everybody like the world does. We see that there's so much more. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Verse 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ, notice what he did, reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Verse 19, that is, In Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against him, and entrusting to us on behalf of Christ. Be reconciled to God. Verse 21. For our sake, I love this, he made him who knew no sin to be sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. This is the promise fulfilled. That God sends Christ who knew no sin to become sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. So the big question is this. As you look at the blessings in your life, as you look at all of God's pouring out over your life, your your physical blessings, your familial blessings, but far more than that, your spiritual blessings, the question is this. Have you truly been reconciled to God? Have you been reconciled to him? This verse says, be reconciled to God. You can be made right with God through this glorious promise. 
Look what it says there on the screen. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. God wouldn't tell you to do something if you can't be that. And he can call you to that by simply coming to recognize that Jesus indeed is the one who came to pay for your sins. That by trusting in him and not trusting in yourself any longer that you can be right with God and the nations will rejoice. All those nations that come, all those people that come and rejoice in him. Notice what it says here. If you are so blessed, you have been blessed to be a blessing. This is the reason God gives us the gospel. This is the reason that Sheridan Hills has been given the gospel. This is the reason that you, if you have been reconciled to God, have been given the gospel, is so that you can call others to see that they too can be right with God. You see, it's wrong for us to seek to spend all of the blessings upon ourselves. It is wrong for us to look at all of these blessings and they're just all about our comfort. It is wrong for us to recognize ourselves as the center of what all of these blessings come. No, indeed, Christ has called us to be a blessing to the nations. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon the earth. Let's pray together.